of our uh, guests here went to their first Seahawks game. <laughs> Seahawks. And so we went to the preseason. And for those of you that are Vikings fans, my apologies for the Vikings. They came all the way out just to lose. But it's a great opening for the season. And uh, I think for Jess, Ben, and Sam, we had a fantastic time. And uh, uh, Pastor Matt was also there with his son. And so, and a couple other friends of ours from the community here. And so it was exciting, and there was probably 20 or 30,000 people there. And uh, to run into people that you know at a ball game, you know. But I want to say the audience that I was sharing it with were absolutely the best, and we had a great time. It was a great time for the Seahawks. And of course, this week was also Kids Fest. And so we saw hundreds of children for Kids Fest. We tested out the train. I wrecked the train on its, <laughs> on its first run. I hit a tree limb and bent one of the posts on the back, on the caboose. And so it's going to go back in the roundhouse for repairs. But we had a fantastic time, saw hundreds of children. Peggy was there. She passed out flyers. And we talked to lots of people about the 26th that's going to be here. So if you want to grab a flyer and, and uh, share it with your neighbors, share it with your grandchildren, the 26th is going to be a great day. The train will be here in full repair. Pancake breakfast, bouncy house, and a lot of other things are gonna happen. So uh, yeah, it's been a tremendous week, a tremendous week for birthdays, and also a tremendous day for the sun. You can see the mountain, you already know it's a good day. Amen. Well, let's bow for a word of prayer, and then we're gonna kick this thing off. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today to celebrate, Lord, to lift up birthdays, anniversaries, Lord, and just the tremendous things that you have brought to us in this season. Seventy years this year, Lord, for this congregation right here in this house. Lord, you continue to change it, expand it, bring new faces. Father, we give you the praise for that. Father, 85 years as a congregation we have been here, Lord, celebrating uh, with you the joys and this community and watching the community grow up around us. Lord, that was all in your vision. Father, we give you the praise and the glory this morning. May you bless our day. May you bless the baptisms that follow. And Father, again, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who makes our salvation possible. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So here's today's message. Lydia, the first European woman of faith. And so you knew it was coming. The European girls, they've got to represent, right? And so we're going to talk about Lydia today. And um, I have some special things for us to look at today. Who wants to play a game with Rabbi Myers? So I feel like Monty Hall, maybe uh, Alex Trebek just a little bit this morning. So we already talked about sports, so I covered the manly portion, the Seahawks. And so, but now we're going to talk about the women of faith. And we have not done a lot of sermons on the women of faith, have we? There's a tremendous list, and this is one of them. And actually, she's a powerhouse all in her own right. And so uh, my game is kind of a special one because Lydia, she had a special role. She was a woman of influence and power. As a matter of fact, she was probably the first fashionista, maybe mentioned in the Bible. And so I have a special game that I wanted to play. Uh, these are women in Lydia's class. And I'm going to say Lydia is in a class all by herself. But uh, so play along with me as we try to guess who these people are. First slide, please. Oh, who do you think this might be? Any takers on this? Her name is on there, actually. <laughs> oh, we took the mystery out of that. Um, that's Coco Chanel, Chanel, Chanel number five. And so, but she is a founder of the Chanel line. And Coco Chanel, a woman of power, influence, and fashion. Notice what color dress she's wearing. Oh, it's purple, isn't it? And so, uh, so are the other ladies there. Coco Chanel, fashion icon. Next slide, please. This one might be a little bit more difficult. Who can guess who this is? Who's our fashion experts? 
a little bit of the 70s, purple dress again. Go ahead. Diane von Verstenberg. Diane von, von Furstenberg, also a European fashion designer. And there's another thing too, these women are European as well. Next slide, please. That one might have been a little bit tougher. So you had to be a real fashionista to know that one. Who do you think this is? Oh, and her name's on there too. <laughs> All right, The Devil Wears Prada, right? Famous movie, right? And so, yes, this is Miss Prada, also wearing purple, quite the fashion icon. So, next slide, please. Who do you think this might be? That's kind of purple. It might look a little blackish in the photo. Oh, Miss Versace. So how can you have fashion without Miss Versace? Wow. Who scored all four? Oh, man. She put the slides together. <laughs> Sam, you get honorable mention. All right. That was kind of a tough one. Now let's pull up the next slide. Oh boy, this is Lydia, our woman of fashion. And so her role uh, in uh, the church that we're going to see, Thyatira, and all the places that she went to, uh, she was a woman of power and influence, the first European woman. We see her hard at work. Uh, this is, a, of course, artist's conception of what she's doing. And, uh, but there she is. And so we're going to leave this slide up for a while. And now I'm going to talk about the greatness of Lydia and her influence upon the early church. So if you'll turn with me first to uh, Acts 16, starting at verse 9, we'll take a look kind of at calling. And it's funny, just as uh, we were getting up here, just as I was getting up here to uh, deliver this message today, you know, um, um, we talked, I uh, had a side conversation about, you know, we have our plans of where we're going to go, but God always does the calling. He always has a vision. And typically, like in Nigeria, he's always there in advance of what we're going to do. He knows the job that he wants us to do. He knows what's going to happen. And so when we jump on our motorcycles and we take off, uh, he is in charge. He tells us where to go and how it's going to be and the people that we're going to meet. We don't often know, but he knows, of course. So let me read this, and we're going to talk about the vision of the man named Paul. Did Paul know something about vision? Certainly did. He lost his vision, too, in one of his visions, right? So here is uh, verse 9. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, uh, he got uh, ready at once to leave for Macedonia, um, including that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so God always brings forth a vision and a calling, doesn't he? And we're kind of revisiting that ourselves, vision and calling, because the vision always has to come from God. He's the visionary, isn't he? And he's the one that had the plan. He completed the plan of the Jews by adding the rest of the world, the Gentiles, the light to the Gentiles, that was his vision all along. Before he left the planet, before he left the Mount of Olives, that was what he said. We're going to go out and teach to the entire planet the vision that he has. And uh, he's still in charge of it. He is still an active piece of that, even with us today. But certainly at this time. Did Paul see a vision, and was that not real? Of course. And honestly, Paul had some experience with that. And I want to say that many of you do too. When you hear the voice of God, you know him. You know that voice when that's of God. And you can say, yes, Lord, here I am. I'm going to go. I'm going to follow your call. So uh, God certainly was calling. And all the places that he calls, Paul took off. He started to go. He saw that as being a real calling to Macedonia. And so the whole world is open to the gospel. God is going to reach all people at all times. And so I'm going to pick up here in verse 12. So if you want to follow me in 16, 
starting at verse 12. We'll take a look at this. From there, we traveled to uh, Philippi, a Roman colony, a leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. Uh, Verse 13, on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. Now, I'm going to stop right there, and I'm kind of going to explain this just a little bit. So uh, the scripture's up on the text. Let's go back to Lydia, the woman. Unless you, does anybody need the scripture up? Let's go back to Lydia, the woman. And if you're following along in your Bible, uh, then you can see this. Let me talk about um, the importance of Philippi and the colony that's here. So there were many places where, the, where synagogues were built, and uh, the Roman world was vast. There were all kinds of places throughout the empire. There were pieces that would be considered today Europe, uh, uh, Asia Minor, it was a vast place, and including now Macedonia, which in the past, there had been whole wars fought between Rome and the Macedonians. And now, uh, it was a place of the gospel. It's interesting how God, over time, is easily, uh, I wouldn't say easily, but he basically brings his message to each of those kings and kingdoms. And so, uh, they're going there, they've decided to stay, Paul and Silas, they followed the call, and they're there on the Sabbath. So this is Saturday. This is a day of worship that they're going to go and, um, and see what's happening in the community because it's more likely that if they're going to preach the gospel and talk about Messiah, they're going to do it first in a community that they might receive welcome, Is right? If you're going to go and preach the gospel in a, in a community, You probably want to start out in the churches first and get to know who the churches are and see where you're going to go from there. And there may be people that will help you, right? So that's exactly what they do. And I say that's a normal thing for them to do. So they go to the city gate um, where the river is, and they're uh, expecting to find a place of prayer. Now, the reason they go to the river is this. There's no synagogue in this community. And so it is a Gentile community. This place doesn't have a synagogue, but there are other people there from the world, and they are God-fearers, not necessarily proselytes, but people who are following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? And so that's what Lydia is. She's a person of power and influence, and she follows the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, but there's no synagogue. And they're looking for a place of prayer. Now, Judaism is a little bit different because you have to have a minion. And there's a famous cartoon about minions, right? Yeah, they look kind of funny. (laughs) Different minions. But minions in Judaism is 10 people. So 10 is a significant number in the scripture. Whenever you see 10, just think in your mind, minions. And try to get the one-eyed glasses, you know, yellow. Okay. Try not to think about that too much. So there was no minion. There wasn't ten men. And I remember once when I was in Jerusalem, it was just before the Shabbat, I was actually sneaking to McDonald's to eat a cheeseburger really fast, you know, because a cheeseburger isn't kosher, it's meat and dairy together. But Jerusalem, right near my house, about two blocks away, was a McDonald's. They served cheeseburgers on the Shabbat. So I went there, and an ultra-Orthodox person, a Lubavitcher, actually stopped me on the way. They needed a tenth man (laughs) for prayer before they could open up. And I want to say, man, my Hebrew liturgy is, uh, is, is horrid, especially in Israel. And so, but uh, they pulled me in, I went in, I became the tenth man for prayer just for the Shabbat so they could pray as a minion. And the person said to me, uh, you're my savior. And I was thinking, oh, I'm not your savior, but I know the savior, and I'm going to be your 10th man. And I would say, that's a true story. That actually happened. On the way to a cheeseburger, I became one of the minion. (laughs) Only in Israel, right? So there were not 10 men, 
But there were these ladies of the church, ladies of power and influence, and they're meeting at the river because what would be more natural? And often that was true, that congregations that weren't big enough or couldn't support a synagogue or a place of worship, they would meet either in a park, by a river, or something that's natural and majestic, something that God had built. And so that's where they are. Naturally, that's where Paul's going to go, and he's going to uh, go and preach. And so uh, he goes there, he speaks to the women, and one of those listing was the woman from Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. So her name is kind of interesting because there are some theologians and Bible scholars that would say that Lydia, her name means uh, dealer in purple. But really it means noble woman or beautiful. I want to say how many beautiful women have served the Lord and how many fashionistas, because she's a woman of power and influence. Purple in this time was an unusual color. And in Europe later on, and she's the first European woman uh, who becomes a convert in this uh, particular story. I want to say this is a beautiful story and a very powerful piece for us to have here. But you had to make purple and sell purple and wear purple in Europe by license because only royalty wore purple. Only noble people wore purple. And her name also means noble woman. You know, beautiful one. And so, fashionista. That's... Uh, throwing that in there. But she is a wonderful person, a woman of influence, a god fear, and here comes her moment when she hears the gospel being preached to her, and um, she hears Paul's message, and her heart begins to open up to the gospel. Was it something that other people had planted earlier? Did she not hear the word of God? Did she not pray to God? Now came the time when the man of God, when everything lined up, her heart opened, God opened her heart. And it's interesting because Paul and Silas, they saw the vision, they heard the call, and they followed it. And part of what we're talking about in the book of Acts is following the call, following that particular calling, that still small voice of God. When the eunuch... Um, was asking for um, uh, explanation about the gospel, and um, um, I want to say it was Andrew that left a revival, basically, to talk to one person, the eunuch, who is a person of power and authority, too. He's basically driving a Ferrari. He's in a chariot, right? <laughs> you know, reading the scroll of Isaiah, right? Do you understand this? I want to say, a lot of times people, you find yourself at the crossroads, you may be alone with them, and you may be explaining something that is deep, deep in their heart. So here it is. Here is the moment that it takes place. And so Lydia hears the gospel. She becomes a believer. She's the first convert in, uh, from Judaism or, or god fear. She's not even a proselyte yet. Um, but becomes a woman of God at this moment. She was searching for God, wasn't she? She absolutely was. And not only uh, does she find God, receive God, and receive the Spirit, but she also, uh, her whole household does too. And there's a lot of speculation on who Lydia was. Was she a slave or what was she? But I don't know that she was a slave or any of those kinds of things. She owns a whole household. She has a whole industry, a whole, she might have been a widow. There might have been other factors that we don't know, but that's kind of speculation on our part. But the fact that she owned the whole household and that her speech was persuasive to them, her whole house comes to the Lord and she offers her house now to the missionaries. We see an example of Christian hospitality. And I want to say, if you have received Christian hospitality, either from this house or from somebody else's house, what a blessing that is. She opens it up to the missionaries. Her whole house comes to the Lord. And I want to say, of Jesse and Tanya, their whole house belongs to the Lord now. Yeah, as of today, their whole house will be a house 
that belongs to Jesus. They have preached the gospel message to their own children. And man, God has just opened up their hearts. Now I want to say, what a tremendous thing. Today we witness what that's actually like. The whole house, that's what Lydia does. And I want to say, when we mention that uh, she is the first Gentile convert, look at the power, look at the calling. Sometimes we go someplace just for one person. But look at the influence. Then she goes back to Thyatira from here because she's a woman of business. She's a world traveler, right? And she also plants churches there to the fact that it's also mentioned by Jesus in uh, the book of Revelation. It talks about the church of Thyatira. So you can take a look at that, look it up. It's interesting. It's on the map. We stand on the shoulders of greatness, our church. We stand on top of all those who came before us, all the converts, all the stories, all those people. We stand on top of their shoulders. Every one of them matters. You know, uh, God said that Jesus would not lose one. Not one that the Father has given him, and he won't. They all matter, each person. Even the fashion designers of this time Look what she did for Christ. Lydia, a woman of God, a woman of noble character. So um, let me encourage you to be hospitable, just like her. Open your house up. Open your house up to the gospel. See what happens. That's my action step. That's one of my action steps. Open up and see what happens. See what a blessing it is and how God uses that blessing. So next I'm going to talk about Paul and Cyrus in prison. And this story begins in Acts 16.16. Uh, 16, and I'm just going to, going to tell the story. And here is our key verse in this, which is um, verse 29 of 16. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to receive the gospel? So I want to tell this story a little bit. On the way back from the exorcism, they just cast out a demon out of a woman here. And I want to say, sometimes the stories of the gospel or the, um, the acts, our history, they're kind of fanciful, very dramatic and very colorful. They just cast out of a demon out of a woman. And I want to say that can happen in this country and certainly happen outside of that. But when they do, it creates a riot. You know. This girl can no longer prophesy now. She's not worth anything. This is what we paid her to do, and now she can't do it. They created a riot. And from that riot, Paul and Silas end up in jail. Imagine that. You just can't make this stuff up. It has to be true. Come from an exorcism, create a riot, create a disturbance of a whole other kind, end up in jail, and everybody knows about it, and then, this happens. So let me turn your attention to um, uh, verse 20, or uh, actually verse 25. So about midnight, Paul and Cyrus, uh, Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. You never know when you're going to be singing the prison blues, and somebody's going to be hearing it. Oh Lord, <laughs> break down these prison walls. And so, and then suddenly there was a violent earthquake. The foundations of the prison were shaken. And we say, how many prisoners pray for that? <laughs> Sometimes our lives can be a prison too, can't they? Right? Man, Lord, make these walls fall down. Oh, man, praying hard. Put your hand on it. Make it fall down. And they did. So the foundations of the prison were shaken. All, uh, all uh, at once, all the prison doors flew open. What an amazing thing. Uh, they just all miraculously flew open. And everyone's chains came loose. Boy, there's another answer to prayer. And before we saw Peter, right, knocking at the door, he'd just been released from prison. Those guards died, though, didn't they? Those people holding the prisoners... When Herod found out about it, he was furious. Oh, no, I'm not believing any supernatural stories. You folks are dead. You let them go. We were going to kill them. Now look what happened. So the doors fly open. He drew his sword and was about to kill himself. 
This is the jailer when he woke up. And uh, so he goes through and shouts, uh, looking for the prisoners, because what's going to happen to the jailer as a result of uh, all the doors flying open, the prisoners escaping and loose? What's going to happen to the jailer? <laughs> yeah, he's not going to make it, right? And then he starts to shout, and to, to miracle of miracles for the jailer, they're still there. They stayed. They didn't go. They were free. They could have gone, right? But they stayed. I'm sure they knew the other story, right, and what had happened. But they stayed, and they saved everyone through their testimony and through what happened. Everybody got saved. And the jailer asks, Sir, what must I do to be saved? The jailer of the prison, what a testimony. Stuff like that just doesn't happen, but this is incredible stuff, isn't it? Just can't make this kind of drama up. When you hear it in the story, it's like, oh man, if this isn't true, this is like, oh brother, where art thou kind of stuff. You know, you just can't make this up. And so the jailer goes and he becomes baptized. And they say to him, they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved, you and your household. Wow. Believe. Trust in. They were baptized. Lydia was baptized. They were baptized. Acts 2.38, right? Repent and be baptized. Those are the words of Peter. That's what the gospel is about. Turning and returning because teshuva, it means repent, but it means to turn. You're going one way, now you're going to turn back to his face, back to his countenance. You're going to return to his blessing. If you weren't walking in that way and it's your first time, now you're going to be walking in his blessing. You're going to turn and you're going to face him. You're going to leave the emptiness of what you had and you're going to face him and you're going to face his blessing in a great way. Repent and be baptized. I wanted to add one more scripture because this is important and a friend of mine reminded me of it. It was actually Taylor Murray. Uh, he talked about it uh, this week to a group of people and I thought, you know what? I mentioned Isaiah last week, you know, that the book of Isaiah is full of what's going to happen to the Gentile nations. And so here it is, uh, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6. I just want to talk about the Messiah. This is one of the songs of the servant, one of the songs of the Messiah. And it's very cryptic. And as we go along in the songs of the servant, which is Isaiah 49 uh, through Isaiah 53, uh, we, it's the resume of the Messiah. He's telling us what he's going to do. And so it opens up in that way. From the womb, God knew who he would be. And, but he says something really interesting, you know, about uh, his servant, his deliverer. So in verse 6 of 49, it says this. He says, and that's God, is it too small a thing for you to be my servant? It's too small a thing for you to just serve me. And I would say the same to you. You know, even though this is speaking about the Messiah, he's a servant of God the Father, he's, and he's serving us as well. He girds up his waist, right? And he serves us, he washes our feet. Everything that he did for us, he did for us. Every single thing. There's nothing that we really bring to the table. We come dirty, he washes us clean. He serves us. God is the greatest of servants. He makes us clean and whole. And he says this, to restore the tribes of Jacob. Yeah, that's an expectation, right? If you're Jewish, you sure hope that we all get identified at some point in history than all of the tribes, because they're not identifiable right now. We don't know who they are. We have speculation and some historical evidence of where they might have gone, but we don't know where they are. It's a mystery even to this day. But it's too small a thing for him to even do that. That's not enough. There's more on the plate. It's not just enough that he's going to be the king of Israel. He'll always be that. To just assemble the tribes and put them together, but he's going to do this. Bring back Israel, and I have kept 
I will also make you a light to the Gentiles that my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. So we see it in Lydia, right? First, Gentile. And no, you know, a woman of power and influence. And look what she does. She's spreading the gospel like the missionaries that she's hosting. It's a woman of power and influence. But it wasn't enough for him to just save the tribes of Israel, that is Jesus, the servant of God. He's going to save the whole world. And look how he starts. Look at the stuff that happens. It's the stuff of legend today. When I look at the gospel stories that goes out and the missionary stories that we see, and I see the gospel go around the globe every single day. We go to bed, we lay our heads down, and I say this a lot, but I mean it. God continues to work, he continues to serve, and his servants continue to serve all around the globe. Today we're going to have two more baptisms. You know, two more people are going to uh, say that they believe and they believe.